but the divine between good and evil cuts through the heart of every human being. And who is willing to destroy a piece of his or her own heart? That's Solzhenitsyn in the Gulag Archipelago, but it speaks very strongly to all of us, I think. It speaks to me in terms of conflict transformation which is, and peace building, which is my background, but it speaks very strongly to the impact of the visit um, that I paid with colleagues nearly three months ago now. My experience, although I went out there with hopes of really exploring what was happening there, the most the powerful effect has been to make me come back to myself, my own values, my country and its role in the world, past and present. It's as if I was trying to look at Syria through a glass and the glass kept turning into a mirror. So I hope I can convey something interesting and useful to you about the experience of that visit. There's a health warning, a terribly strong health warning. Just imagine someone comes for a week to your own situation and then they stand up in front of a whole lot of people and tell them how it is. So everything I say has to be qualified by the fact that it's a snapshot at a particular time and to generalize from those things is always risky. It was a very challenging visit physically because there was a certain amount of risk and it was very intense. We never stopped moving from A to B. That was partly to dodge potential harm flying around the air, but partly also because there were so many people to see and meet. It was difficult ethically. Is it right to talk to people who are apparently responsible for crimes against humanity? Should one not stay somehow insulated from such terrible people? And is it right to be guarded by soldiers? Because we were. But the choice we had was either go and be guarded by soldiers or go and maybe not come back. And it was challenging intellectually. How can one hold multiple perspectives in one's head and still stay sane? Because we did hear multiple perspectives and we heard very different ones from what we often get here. So what I would like to do is to say a little bit to begin with about who went on this little visit, why we did it and where we went, say a bit more about who we met and what they told us, and then to offer you some observations and reflections. Uh, and if there won't be a chance for discussing these things that I'm raising now, but I'm around and I'm hoping that might feed into the understanding of the rest of the afternoon. So, the group was a very eclectic group, I think it's fair to say. There were three parliamentarians, all of them from the House of Lords, an architect interested in physical reconstruction, an NGO worker, and myself coming from a peace building and conflict transformation background. We were all self-funded because we wanted to make the point that we weren't anybody's poodle. Uh, but obviously that probably limited the amount of people who could go because many of us were dependent on well-wishers to ha help us with the costs. Why did we go? We were invited. I should have said that one of the people who came on this visit is Andrew Ashdown, who's here. Andrew actually organised the visit, so he is a great fount of knowledge and is a great discipline to me. I can't tell you we did all sorts of things we didn't do because he'll say, no, we didn't. So we went at the invitation of faith leaders, both Muslim and Christian. That was the ostensible reason and the real one. We also went to express solidarity with Syrian suffering, to listen as hard as we could to what life is like for them and what they would like to happen in terms of future peace. And we also went because we thought and still think that British policy in relation to Syria is completely sterile and possibly and probably a lot worse and really needs some input to try and sharpen it in terms of the needs. Personally, I, my, part of my work is with Syrian activists who come out to Lebanon for periods of time and I'm part of a team which helps them reanalyze their situation, uh, helps them strategize and so I wanted to go and get a sense of really what the situation is that they're coming from to be able to be more effective in that. 
We went, where did we go? We went to Damascus for several days, then we made a dash for Aleppo, uh, and we spent the best part of a day there. And then we went, came out of Aleppo and we went down to the coast in Latakia, where we spent some time meeting people, and then we came back to Damascus. It sounds terribly easy, but it's like you're zigzagging all the time to make sure that you're in areas where you're likely to be able to get from one end to the other. And we were reliably told by the, the people who are guarding us that the opposition have got the latest interception equipment, uh, possibly from here, uh, so that they can hear whatever the Syrian army is doing. So they couldn't talk to each other about where we were going to go. They had to send somebody ahead to see if the road was safe and then they would come back again and so on. So there's quite a lot of support for armed groups inside Syria, which is, which is not published. So who did we meet? Well, we met the religious leaders who I mentioned. We met a number of political figures. We met the Minister of Reconciliation, who we had a fascinating two hours with. The Minister of Tourism, who assured us that tourism is improving in Syria. But, I, you know, we, we, we've allowed ourselves a sly smile. I think if it's improving, it's starting from quite a low base. And we had uh, two hours with um, President Assad, too, which I'll say a little bit more about in a moment. We also met quite a number of other people, teachers, lecturer, a lecturer at the university, a member of parliament, doctors in Aleppo. Uh, survivors of attacks by Nusra, we met IDPs. So we met quite a lot of people. Inevitably, the range of people we met is not total because there were certain points of view which either they, people couldn't express or they were in areas where, which we couldn't get to. But I still I think that our visit has yielded some kind of validity for what I want to say to you, uh, although it's always going to be hedged around with ifs and buts. So there's no blinding revelation that came to us from this week. And that's sad because we were just next door, to, very close to where St. Paul had his revelation. We were actually on the street that is straight in Damascus for a little while. But the, the revelation did not come to us that came to St. Paul so long ago. But I want to offer you just five fairly modest reflections, if I may, which are based, based on experience. And the first is that there is no, no goodies in this scene. There, are no, there isn't a nice separation between people who we think will do the good thing and people who are brutes. The regime, the armed opposition of all sorts, the UK and its allies, Iran, Saudi Arabia and their allies, everyone has killed indiscriminately on occasion, sometimes on purpose, sometimes by mistake. No hands are clean. Secondly, the moderate armed opposition seems to have largely evaporated. And if you remember, the moderate armed opposition was, in a sense, the ground on which the West decided to intervene to support them. When you look for them, you don't find them. When you ask about them, you don't hear about them. And the recent Select Defence Select Committee report here came to the same conclusion, that these moderate armed groups were in existence but faded away maybe three years ago uh, for all sorts of reasons and are now under the umbrella of um, Islamist groups. And that raises a question about how effective Free Syrian Army uh, representatives are going to be. They are uh, outside the country in, in Turkey. How, ex how effective they can be when they don't have any real ground people on the ground. So that was my second point. The third is that people living in regime areas are living relatively reasonable lives, or were in September when we were there. Schools are functioning, hospitals are working, shops are open, there's electricity. Interestingly, the electricity was bought from ISIS because ISIS took control of the major oil wells. So this funny thing that war isn't funny at all, but it's comic, perhaps. Arrangement whereby one side funds the other in order to survive, and of course by funding the other you're increasing their capacity to wage war. There was water 
in those areas. There was order in the regime areas. Now, I'm not an apologist for the regime, but I do think it's important to recognize what is there. And many people in that situation don't want the regime to collapse. They don't want it to disappear. Uh, there was a teacher we met uh, who said this to us. I hate the word freedom. Freedom to me means guns and bullets and killings. I have deleted the word from my vocabulary. We had order and peace before they brought us freedom. Now, there's all sorts of issues behind that, but you see the sentiment that, that people desperately need order. And this other thing may be in that situation more than they want right now. I asked her, incidentally, how she kept hope alive, and she said, I just take one day at a time. I'm grateful that my daughters and I survive. That's all. Um, Aleppo. Aleppo was a case in point. We got, when we got to Aleppo, we, found, we were surprised by the fact that about one and a half million people living in West Aleppo are, were, certainly in September, leaving, leading relatively reasonable lives. Shops are open, cars are, are moving, schools are working, hospitals are open. And we, we met, rather by accident, a group of doctors. This was because we were on our way to see some faith leaders. And the place that we were going to was being shelled at the time of the meeting, so it was thought wiser not to go there. And we, we met these doctors just incidentally, and I say that because they weren't therefore set up to be the voice of. And they talked about their, their ability still to function, but the problems that they had were partly because of sanctions. But I, I would be wrong if I don't say that there were fairly continual examples of shells and things arriving in the West, um, so there, there was that problem as well. But inside those areas, there are good things happening. I rem well remember a, a chat we had with a woman parliamentarian. I say woman because Syria is quite notable for the way that the genders are relatively equal in terms of the initiatives they can take. And um, she spoke of the work that she was doing with youth in different parts of, of Syria. We met another a lecturer from Damascus who said he's doing nonviolent communication with his students there. And that's a particular approach to help people break down barriers of identity and ethnicity. So given this relative stability in, in the regime areas, it seems to me, and I can't speak for the rest of our group, but I think I almost could, that our approach here of a priori regime change is likely to cause a lot more misery to a lot more people. And my fear is that it would lead to another regime, fa a, a failed state, essentially. And if one thinks that things are bad now, if you take the state away completely, Hobbes described only too well what humans do to each other when there is no state and no order. So it's not a nice place to be here, that we have a very clear dictatorship with some nasty things to its name. Uh, if it's not there, who fight, fights over the spoils and what does, that, what does that lead to? What did Assad have to say? We had, as I say, we had a couple of hours with him. He was a very personable host. I remember we walked up the stairs. He showed us into a nice airy room, gave us tea. And he started off by saying, well, I'm not going to lecture you. Um, just ask me questions and we'll, I'll reply. And for two hours, we did just that. Uh, and it was surreal because we knew only too well what, what's, what's going on. I have a personal friend who's been tortured by, uh, by, by the regime and has never been the same since. Um, but we were able to put those points to him. Uh, and he was able to respond in a way which was plausible. That is to say, he didn't fly into a rage, nor did he necessarily convince us, but it was this odd feeling of having a discussion with someone about these kinds of things, and yet at the same time thinking about the realities that there are just, just beyond the door, really. We asked him about what legacy he would like to leave, and he spoke about there needing to be a secular state, there needing to be equality of the sexes, an active civil society. Some might laugh hollowly, given the opportunities that civil society have had so far. And I think unspoken were, was, this is all on condition that my family survives, uh, that the security services are as strong as they are now. 
Uh, and so there was a lot unsaid, clearly, and we were aware of that. Kieran, you can't do this to me. Time. Yeah, it's Syrian time. I'm on. <laughs> well, we're, de we're definitely on Coventry time. Oh, 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 right, you never told me. Okay, very nearly finished. Um, I think... Two minutes? I think... One thing it's really important to notice is that we have a very one-sided narrative here from the media. And that's something which is not helpful in the sense that it is tending to demonise as, uh, an aspect of the conflict when, as I say, all sides are doing all sorts of terrible things to each other. I mean, it's interesting that we're looking at the white helmets tonight and there's a prize being given to them because... There is complexity over the white helmets, like everything else in war. There is a complexity about the amount of money they're receiving from Western governments. Where does it go? Why, are they, why is there no telephone number in Syria to call them? There are complexities around things like that, which we're not really introduced to through our media, which just likes to deal with things as it's uh, good or bad. One of them said to me... And several Sorry, people. Simon. So we're going to have to wrap up now. Right, we're going to have, one of them said to me, he's going to wrap Simon, me up. Simon, Simon is around for the. He for is, the next he's around in a square, a peg in a round hole. But if this has taught me anything, it is that we have to get out of our national self righteous bubble. We are doing fine, it's them. And we have to look back, we have to look at ourselves and the way that we've played into this situation and start to think again, like. Solzhenitsyn suggested, look at ourselves because it's in here, a lot of what's happening there. And if we're going to start intervening constructively there, the first stage, I think, is to reflect deeply on the way we've contributed to the situation now. Thank you so much, everybody, for listening. Thank you very much, Simon.